I just finished reading The Prince of Thorns by Mark Lawrence. This is the first book in the Broken Empire trilogy, and it follows Prince Jorg Ancraft, a decidedly nasty protagonist who is about to return home after multiple years of raping and pillaging the landscape with his band of outlaws. You get a sense of the kind of character you are dealing with from the very first chapter, where Jorg steals, rapes, and kills people with his troop of men for no reason but loot. And this is the crux of the book, the major selling point. Jorg is the most unlikable character imaginable, treating everyone around him like they are pawns in his scheme. Even his, you know, so-called friends, his brothers. The cherry on top is that this is a story told from the first-person perspective, giving the reader a close telling of his actions and psychology. Also, he just turned 14. I was drawn into this story from the very beginning, and I'm happy to say that I was satisfied with the story throughout the course of the novel, and I will be jumping into the next book very soon. I might read Of Mice and Men real quick beforehand, since it's just an easy read, though. The part of the book that I liked the most was basically everything I mentioned above. The protagonist is basically the selling point of the series, and it is the main thing that dragged me into this world, and it will be the reason I'm continuing. It's actually kind of funny reading through the many, many reviews talking about how unlikable Yorg is, and how this story is not for them, and how much Lawrence risks going this route, knowing my own reaction. I've probably said this a thousand times at this point, but dark characters are always my favorite, especially the ones who do the unforgivable. It's especially funny because I think one of my own characters in my own novel is even more unlikable than Yorg is. It's easy to forget how niche your work is. Either way, I'm actually willing to admit that Yorg wasn't even as bad as I was expecting, and I've definitely read characters who are a lot nastier and cold-blooded. Seeing Yorg occasionally run up against the wall of his emotions was refreshing to me, at least showing that he wasn't utterly devoid of humanity. His backstory was alright, and not something that truly captured me, but also not something that disappointed me. What truly grabbed me was just one spoiler aspect of the flashback that undercuts Yorg's character and motivations, making you question how things had gone and where they might go in the future. I'll touch on that later. The plot was a little scattered and rambling in nature. It was obvious that the book was not selling itself on a driving plot or intricate scheming, but it wasn't let down or even irritated by it. And one thing I actually did enjoy was how the plot developed in a way that allowed the story world to reveal itself over time. The world building overall was minimal, but those who have read it know what I am referring to here. And that leads to the second point I want to make in this section. I really enjoyed the reveal about the story world. In particular, it was the way that Lawrence let the information come out over the course of the story. He could have treated this as some jaw-dropping revelation that throws everything into disarray, but it would have probably fallen flat, given that it's been done before. Instead, Lawrence just let the information drip in until you realize what is being communicated. I imagine that the story world choice will only become more important as the series progresses, and Lawrence introduced it here in a perfect way. The final point is about the magic system. It is a fairly soft magic system, as is often the case for very dark stories, and the portrayal was especially compelling to me. The way the scenes felt and the way they influenced the story was terrifying even, and I can't wait to see how this changes over time. I'll bring up the specifics in the spoiler section. The prose in this novel is very simple and clear in the best way possible, but there was a more specific use that truly grabbed my attention. There are multiple dream sequences in this book where Yorg becomes lost in his nightmares, and I really appreciated the way this was executed. Because of the discussion around Jason Furman's book A Song for the End of the World, particularly how to portray a mentally unstable protagonist from a first-person perspective, I was in that headspace while reading this book. The problem at hand was finding a way to ground the reader enough that they aren't flailing about for something concrete, while also setting them on edge with the twist of uncertainty that the protagonist is experiencing. Lawrence touched upon this idea with these dream sequences. There were moments where you were led to think that he had woken up only to have that subverted later on, and this did an excellent job putting you into Jorg's scattered psychology and the uncertainty that came with it. What made the sequence work so well was having the scenes be surrounded by beginning and ending scenes that ran parallel. Either that, or they were common threads that the reader could grasp on to understand what was going on. Part of the reason Lawrence was able to accomplish this is because these dream sequences were the exception to the rule. 
The whole of Yorg's experiences was not as detached and unstable as these specific moments. And this asks the question, can this detached experience be communicated in a story where a person's psychology is so ravaged that there really is no common thread? My thinking is that you are going to have to move away from the first person perspective, or at least scale back the amount of depth if you want to accomplish this. Another option is to provide a common thread and make the reader think they are grounded, only to pull the rug and show that the common thread is just their delusions. One example would be if a character travels through a world where things seem fantastical, only to reveal that the character is just insane at the end. Either way, I found that I really appreciated these dream sequences in Lawrence's book. One minor complaint would be near the end of the book. I can't get into the specifics because of spoilers, but the general idea is that Lawrence basically mentioned what was going to happen by essentially breaking the fourth wall, and this put me off. In retrospect, I understand what Lawrence was doing. You know, it's not exactly breaking the fourth wall, but I would have removed that section. As usual, I'll bring this up in the spoiler section. For obvious reasons, I can't say much about the ending in the non-spoiler section here. My overall evaluation was positive, though there were a number of specifics that I was asking him questions about. Some things had the potential to be disappointing, but I am also aware of how the story might develop in the future, so I'm not too critical yet. Now for the question we have all been waiting for. Is this the darkest book I have ever read? Is this book darker than R. Scott Baker's Second Apocalypse? The short answer is no. <laughs> Part of the answer is going to be subjective, like horror, different people find different things disturbing. From my own experiences, I can say that even the first book of Baker's series had a profoundly more discomforting impact on me. I generally enjoyed this book, and I actually kind of like Yorg as nasty as he is, but he didn't get under my skin. Almost nothing gets under my skin. It is really only Baker's series that has truly put me on edge. Some of the characters, the circumstances the characters find themselves in, and the way that Baker builds up the dread over the course of the story is unparalleled. I might be able to deal with Yorg if I met him in real life, yet a certain character in Baker's story truly leaves me terrified. Everything that he represents is basically everything that I fear. And he is the perfect example of horror extending into the thematic realm of the story. But it goes beyond even that particular character. I finished Baker's book feeling filthy and unwashed. I came out of it feeling as I did with Gillian Flynn's sharp objects, feeling as if sex were an inherently animalistic and bestial act, with the thought that I might just go celibate from that point on. And the series just gets darker from there. Baker still reigns at the top. Overall, I enjoyed this book. I think I will give it a 7 out of 10. The reveal I was referring to was the fact that this story is set in a post-apocalyptic Europe. Lawrence could have shocked us all with a stunning reveal that was basically played out and uninteresting. But instead, he went for a slow crawl realization. There is no point at which the reader is supposed to apprehend the truth. The information just builds until it can't be ignored. I was technically spoiled on this from the outset, but I still noticed very early on the references to Bertrand Russell and Nietzsche. It started with subtle references, and then we got slapped with artificial intelligence and nukes. And while I am talking about the nukes, I think I should very quickly pick up the one complaint that I mentioned before. At the end of the chapter where Yorg takes one of the nukes and plants it underneath the castle he wants to capture, Lawrence basically breaks the fourth wall and tells the readers that the consequences would have been infinitely worse if Yorg had gone through with his original plan. I hate it when chapters end with statements like, And they would never see each other again. Shut up. Don't tell me this crap. This is a cheap gag for getting the reader invested. The story itself should be sufficient for that. As I also mentioned, I understand the obvious implication here. Yorg is likely telling the story after the fact, and we are reading a written account. This chapter's ending also functions as a kind of hint toward that, especially given the fact that this is first person rather than omniscient. The ending further supports this. I don't know if this will all become more relevant later on. We will have to see. Either way, I still don't like how the chapter ended. It was not necessary. One character moment that I particularly liked was when Yorg had found Mackin in the cell and was realizing that he would have to kill Mackin if he were to follow his pragmatic code. But he hesitates and Mackin manages to knock him unconscious. What happens after that? Well, the next scene we are treated to is one where Mackin and Yorg are walking together discussing their future plans. 
I laughed out loud at this, and for all the right reasons. I really appreciated the way Lawrence was willing to skip over the finer details, because the readers are able to fill in those gaps just fine on their own at that point in the story. It is an excellent example of parsimony. But I think the best character moment in the book is when Corian is revealed in the flashback, and we realize alongside Yorg that he was flushed of his memory and manipulated into losing his hatred for Count Raynar. Earlier in the book, we are led to think that Yorg had simply moved on from the desire for revenge. This undercuts all of that, forcing us to realize that Yorg was actually just a pawn at the hands of Corian. It makes you question whether this violent and amoral monster you've been following up to this point was fashioned into this person. Part of me wished that he really was fashioned to a monster given the implications, but the book ended with the implication that Yorg is like this without Corian around. I'm not disappointed, and I get the appeal of this approach too. You know, you're undercutting the hope that he might actually have humanity or be worth saving. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wishy-washy, let's say that. I also question why Yorg remembered Corian in the first place, in a good way. You know, these are good questions to ask. It happens when Yorg is stabbed by his father, but I'm left to wonder what the actual cause was. Did Corian allow Yorg to remember? That was my first thought, though the book ends in a way that suggests no. Aside from Corian, it might have been the other sorcerer who, <laughs> whom I can't remember the name of, the one who works for Yorg's father. He has reason to be rid of Yorg, and it also set Yorg's sights back on Count Raynar and Corian both. We will see. Finally, for this section, Corian and his sorcery were what I was referring to when I mentioned that I liked the magic system. The whole notion of sorcerers who can manipulate the motivations and memories of others is a rather disturbing concept, and I hope the series will carry on along this thread for the next books. One nitpick worth mentioning is that I thought Corian explaining why he wasn't king was a bit too on the nose. The comment seemed to be shoehorned in, and it really wasn't that necessary. It's not hard for the reader to fill in an obvious explanation. I have scattered feelings about the fight with Corian at the end of the book. I almost said mixed feelings, but I don't know if that captures my reaction. On one hand, I'm left thinking that the fight was a bit anticlimactic with how the fight concluded. Corian only lost because of some freak occurrence. At the same time, I know that this isn't the last book. There is still more to come, and with the question of how to defeat these sorcerers still looming in the background, we are poised with more questions about how Yorg is supposed to proceed. The fact that he only won because of luck makes a person like Corian all the more formidable. I would not call my reaction mixed, at least because I'm going to wait until the later books to see whether this kind of ending is worth it. Another question I have about the ending is how the confrontation with Count Raynar was portrayed. Lawrence cut away right after Yorg began his charge. The story then ends with an account after the fact telling the reader that the Count was now in captivity and was being tortured by Yorg on a regular basis. It's usually not a good idea to cut away right before the emotional climax of the story. At the same time, I wasn't exactly disappointed by this. Maybe the fact that Yorg is so unlikable makes this option both more appealing and easier to get away with. Maybe there's some twist later down the line that will make this come together. I think this is unlikely, but we will have to see. Overall, I enjoyed this book. I think I will give it a 7 out of 10.